The talk I'm going to try to present deals with Shoah terminology and time permits also Shoah theology. The terminology is the actual language that we use in regard to what is referred to as the greatest genocidal activity so recorded in history, so maintained by so many people. But I'd like to go into another type of terminology. How factual, by that I mean how accurate are the statements made when one talks about actions of genocide or extermination or annihilation, or the world knows, at least in regard to the Jewish people in mid mid 20th century from Europe, the Holocaust period. The term terminology is very crucial because of what I think is a very basic element of human thinking, and that is language and how language influences the way we think. So if I use the word Holocaust to refer to the genocide of the Jewish people, then the word Holocaust itself is not an English word. It comes from a Greek origin, holocaustos, which means a burnt offering. And the burnt offering implies a recipient and a giver. The recipient are the gods, or in this case, a singular god, and the giver are the people who bring the offering. And hence, if one calls the genocidal activity against the Jews between the 1939-1945 World War II period, the extermination of Jews by Nazi Germany, then what you have is an anomaly which I cannot accept. God is the caller, and the Nazis are the giver, and the offering are the Jews, and others, I might add. That figure of six million and five million seems to be very appealing. But how accurate, how factual is the count of six million Jews and five million non-Jews? Where does the language actually come from? Did people have enough time to count the bodies that were they are exterminated? Is it possible to count ashes upon ashes upon ashes? How many ashes are not found? How many bones are not discovered? Where does six and five million come up from? I am told by a scholar who criticized my use of the language of six million to five million, which is the accepted universal acceptance of, 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 the, of the thing called the Holocaust, um, that I was wrong, that I'm quoting somebody by the name of Simon Wiesenthal who is known as the great Nazi hunter, who indeed came up with that figure, it seems, of 6 million, and then threw in as an ad lib the number 5 million based on the assumption, if you talk about the genocidal activity of 6 million Jews, would the world really pay attention as the Jews are the Jews of the Jews? And as we can see today, the Jews are very much a lonely people when it comes to accusation of Israel's war in Gaza right now. And so the need to have Gentiles added, hence the number 5 million. And so the declared number of 11 million, which does not include at all the sum total of people killed in the warfare of World War II. This is what I mean by how people use a language and how language can be deceitful, can be conceitful, can be meaningful, or can be false. And I guess that's what I like to talk about. Before I go into the terminology Holocaust and alternate words for it, let me bring in another concept. And that is the concept of the divine. That's your theology. God as God is God. And what is to be said about him in the act of the genocide of the Jewish people? To begin with, let me begin with a factual that word genocide itself means the murder of a people. Gens is a Latin phrase, side deals with murder or killing. And hence that term genocide never existed. I repeat, never existed. I'll repeat a third time, never existed in the history of languages until the early 1940s. That's when that term was first coined. Does it therefore mean if the term was never used before 1942 or thereabouts, that there never was a genocide? Of course, there were acts of genocidal activity, but the actual word itself was coined in the early 1940s. That's what happens. When a word is coined, does it mean it actually began at that moment? Or are there other events previous without that term, which similarly mean the same thing? 
This is the issue of language, how to see it either as factuals or as actuals. And that terminology, factuality and actuality, is my preferred term to distinguish something which is real and something which is imagined. A fact is a fact is a fact. An actual is how we see facts. We don't really see facts as facts. We see something, we interpret it consciously or not consciously. We inherit it from some other source, whatever, and then it becomes actual by us. Actual is how we relate to things, but it's not necessarily factual. And in that regard, I need to have a formula. If something occurs once, twice, three times in succession following rabbinic tradition, it will be seen by me as a chazakah. The word chazakah means strength. It means power. It means permanence. If something happens once, it's a possibility that it can be real or not real, even if it happens a second time. But by the third time already, in succession, it can be seen as something that is factual, not just something realized to be factual, which is what I mean by actual. So that term, chazaka, is crucial. Keep that language in mind. Also keep in mind the language regarding the deity. Judaism's two terms for God, one of them is Elohim, which translates as God. The other is the four-letter name of God, the yud heh vav -Heh, the Y-H-W-H. -H. And some people refer to it in English as the Jehovah word. That word refers to Lord. But having used those words, God and Lord, there is a distinction made. Not in the entity. God as Lord, Lord as God, let's assume, is understood to be one and the same. But in the action, in the reference, in how it is seen, those terms. God as God, the Elohim, is identified with justice. And the word Hashem, the term that Jews use, not to make invalid the four sacred letters of the yud heh vav -Heh, um, is identified with mercy. So for our little presentation, the Hashem, the Lord word, is the attribute of mercy. The Elohim word is the attribute of justice. Also interesting to note is that the word Elohim is both singular and plural. By itself, Elohim can mean gods, G-O-D-S, and by itself, the word Elohim can mean God, G-O-D. It depends on the context. The text and context will help us whether it's to be seen as a singular God or as a plural God. And then there is the problem with another type of attitude. The word Elohim as a singular God has the component of something plural. Here is where Christianity comes on board. Christianity and its tri-unity of God. Tri meaning three, unity meaning singular. In the unity of God, there's a trinity. So says the Christian movement, at least most, most parts of it. And ever since the fourth Christian century, known as the Council of Nicaea in 325, we have a second person, a second entity to God, God the Son. And then several decades later, in the Council of Constantine, you have a third person, a third entity called the Holy Spirit. So when Christians use the term Elohim, they singularly mean God of three units, three components, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, as it is traditionally understood. This then is a confusion. The three that's one and the one that's one is a distinction between Judaism and Christianity. And yet we have in American culture the terminology Judeo-Christianity. Judeo-Christian tradition. The whole point is, is there actually a similarity, a unity between the three? If one has three is one and one is one is one, then how can there be the unity as far as the deity is concerned? But then again, it's the interpretation that claims that the one that is three is basically a singular concept of God anyway. That's where we differ in how we use language how language is applied. With that said, 
let's take a look at the Genesis stories. You have when God began to create heaven and earth is how Genesis chapter one begins. The terminology referring to the deity is the language of God. Well, losing knowledge of Hebrew, using knowledge of Hebrew, the word reshit does not mean in the beginning. Your translations have it as in the beginning, but the Hebrew has a construct for that word. Reshit means beginning of. And then the next word is a verb, bara. Then the next word is a proper noun, Elohim. May I not read that very three words, Reshit bara Elohim, as beginning of God, as beginning of God. There is no noun that complements the word beginning of. And so what do I do with this? The translations in English have it in the beginning. The translations by Jews have when God began to create. The subject is God. It's not beginning of God. But where is the missing word? Beginning of what? And so interpretation commands to set in. According to Jewish rabbinic tradition, based upon a medieval rabbi by the name of Rashi, the beginning of is the missing word of wisdom. Beginning of wisdom, wisdom as wisdom as wisdom, is the creation of the world. Without the creation of the world, a thing called wisdom would not be. That's interpretation. That's how people live their lives. That's what makes a factual into an actual. So with wisdom, the sign of wisdom is the creation of the world with heaven and with earth. As the creation of the world, God creates heaven and earth, so goes the translation. The Hebrew doesn't have it that way. It has eight Shemayim eight Aretz, with the heaven and with the earth, suggesting God and heaven and earth bring about a thing we call the world, the Olam, the actual world as we know it today. So right away, you've got two or three different interpretations of a Hebrew text. Beginning of, something is missing. And then you have the phrase, God with heaven and with earth, suggesting the component of three that brings about the reality that you call the world that we live in. There's that number three again. It's not just God alone. There's also the heaven. There's also the earth that testify together with God. Or to reverse the order, what we can witness, what we do experience, is heaven and earth. We do not witness, we do not experience directly, except in our imagination, except in our interpretation, a thing called Elohim, a thing called God. And this is part of the theology dealing with the Shoah. The Shoah is understood not just simply as acts or acts or acts done by man. The invocation of the term God as God, God as Lord, God is justice, God is mercy, is also part of teaching a Shoah lesson. And yet one is visible and experience the earthly plane, and one is imagined or interpreted or felt or emotional, and that's the heavenly plane. As I take a look at the story of creation, there's a the repeat of that story. After chapter one, there's chapter two, where we have the Lord God, that basically is the creator. Same type of story, but it's the Lord God, suggesting that chapter one is more primeval and chapter two, Lord God, is more realistic, in which you have God as God and Lord as well, suggesting justice and mercy, not just simply justice, is what permits man to do what he does and to think the way he does. Let me repeat myself. If the story of the world's beginning only has the word Elohim, then justice has to prevail. There's no such thing as mercy. It's chapter two, which has the term Lord God, where that word Lord is now invoked, and that implies mercy. Is this not the way we have to conduct ourselves? Can we function strictly only on strict justice? Can we survive strictly on that? No matter how justice is fair, should there not be a mercy or merciful component contained therein? I would like to also suggest that it is this particular chapter 
that basically is behind the Shoah itself. And let me explain that in other dimensions. And as far as the terminology is concerned, there's chapter 22, I believe it is, of Genesis, where you basically have the story of the Akedah. The Akedah is known as the binding of Isaac, sometimes mistranslated, and there goes your language, as the sacrifice of Isaac. The word sacrifice is the word korban in Hebrew. That's not what's found here. Admittedly, Isaac is brought as a, the son of Abraham is brought as an offering. And so here's the word korban. But my suspicion is that when you refer to Genesis 22, the testing of Abraham as the sacrifice of Abraham, it is more influenced by the story of Jesus and the sacrificial death brought to Jesus, which is seen often as a parallel to the sacrificial offering, so to speak, of Isaac. The Akedah is the binding of Isaac, the judgment of God judging, I should say, Abraham, whether Abraham would somehow comply to the judgment of bring your son, your only son, as the text has it, as a ola, as an offering. That Hebrew word ola is the word that translates as Holocaust in Catholic Bibles and possibly other Bibles today. That word ola in the Bible I have in front of me, 1917 Jewish Publication Society translation is the translation of an offering. And so bring Isaac as an offering, as a burnt offering, as he needs to be burnt, so to speak, on a sacrificial altar. This is the terminology that's found. And you have Abraham who basically doesn't want to do this, but his son tells him, you have to, Abba, you have to follow God's rules. Here you have the generation that's the younger telling the older generation, this is what needs to be done. And isn't that a lesson? The older generation has its standards. It's not the same as the younger generation. And the younger generation has its standards, sometimes more provocative and more challenging than the older. It's because Isaac says it's okay, according to rabbinic tradition, does Abraham the father finally concede? Left to himself, Abraham the father would not agree to sacrifice the one who's referred to as his only son, which, by the way, is not factual. There's another son by Abraham. His name is Ishmael. He's from the concubine. He's from the one that his wife, Sarah, says to her husband, Abraham, go into my concubine. You take have a child by him since I'm childless at least according to these stories. So what you have here is the son tells the father, not the traditional, the father tells the son. It's the same Abraham who's willing to stand up for Sodom and Gomorrah, for evil society, you might say, in which he challenges the wrath of God and says to God, your justice should not the judge of earth not do justly. And what if there is a component of innocence among Sodom and Gomorrah do you have to destroy the whole area? And so the challenge to Abraham in that particular chapter of Genesis is produced for me at least the 30. There are no 30 innocents, then 20. There are no 20, then go down to the number 10. And 10 is a basic minimum. And that's where that story ends. Abraham and God go their way, as the language has it. There's no proof of the 10. There's no other choice that justice by Elohim has to be done. But what if there is an innocent which you then destroy? And that is the whole question of the show itself. Are there not innocents among the six million? Are there not innocents in Azza today, if I can update it? Are there no innocents on October 7th when there was the incredible slaughter by two or 3,000 terrorists of the Hamas group and innocent people living on kibbutz in the southern border of Israel. This is the whole issue. If they're innocent, should they not save everybody? Should they not at least be saved themselves? And if there isn't, then why? And how to explain it? And is there not a confusion now? The older generation being instructed by the younger generation, where the younger generation tells Abraham and his generation, you have to do what you have to do. I guess these are issues that are as contemporary as contemporary can be. 
And a story that comes to mind in all of this is the story of 93 Petyako girls. I wrote about them in one of my books called Short and Paradigmatic Genocide, in which we bring out the story of 93 girls said to somehow commit suicide rather than being taken, excuse me, rather than to be taken. by Nazis in a brothel and raped. The believability of a story of that nature is impossible. 93 girls of whom the teacher is 23 years old and the youngest is nine or 10 years old, they actually are going to be raped and commit suicide. Is not committing suicide a violation of Jewish tradition? It is. Is there not in Jewish teaching that one must try to keep his life as much as, much as possible? even to the point of death itself, that you do not take your own life, even if it's hard to live the way you have to, you still have to have that possibility of saving at the end. The story violates it all in the story of 93 very Orthodox Jewish girls committing suicide. And so Lucy Davidovich, for example, an historian, in her book called The War Against the Jews, cites that particular episode and throws it out the window, says it's total fabrication. Whereas somebody by the name of Sholem Osh, who was a great Yiddishist, who wrote about Jesus in Yiddish, Sholem Osh had no problem on page six of the New York Times when the story said to have happened to acknowledge that this is a true story. So one who's the historian uses factuality, says it's ridiculous, this story. And one who is a fiction writer, one who is a left-wing Yiddish writer, claims the story actually happened. And if one walks through the neighborhoods of Israel's cities, you'll find almost every major city, a street that bears the name of the 93. And the number 93, where does that number come from? Why not 10 righteous girls? Why not 36? Why not 18? The number high. What's with 93? I don't know. That doesn't mean I don't have an ability to offer an interpretation on that terminology. I see the number 90 to be how Jews from Ashkenazic lands refer to the number 90 in Hebrew by using letters. Every Hebrew letter has numerical value. The letter 90 in Hebrew is the Tzadi letter. But Ashkenazim don't say Tzadi. They say Tzadik for that letter. That's how they call that letter a Tzadik. But that word tzaddik means righteous. That's what the word means. The letter is tzaddi, not tzaddik. Tzaddi is letter number 90. And the letter that follows that is letter number 100, which is the kuf letter. So if you take the letter tzaddi, you take the letter kuf, and you somehow join them together, you'll get the spelling of the word tzaddik. Let me just show you that. This is the spelling of the word tzaddik. And then you add that letter kuf, that last letter, and you get the word tzaddik. Sorry, that sort of spelling is very weak because of the pen. In any case, that's a possibility. And what about the number three? Tzaddi and tzaddik will give you the word righteous, but it's 93. Well, the number three is that word number I've used at the very beginning. One, two, three. Three represents a hazaka. Three also represents the commandments that a woman must do, which a man can do if he so chooses, but he's not obligated. Where in Jewish law, women are not obligated to do any positive commandment, where the negative commandments is binding upon them, the positive ones may interfere with time, and their basic time is bearing of children and taking care of family. But there are three obligatory positive commandments that a woman must do. One of them is lighting the candles for Shabbat, as in Schindler's List. When you see the smoke of the Friday night candles and the very next scene, you see the smokestacks or of the trains or whatever of the death camps. The second obligatory commandment a woman must do is the baking of the bread for the Shabbat. And the baking of the bread is called the challah. And the baking of the bread called the challah or two challahs, two loaves to suggest the biblical story of the double manna that comes down on the Sabbath day, lest people violate the Sabbath by working, collecting bread on that day. The double portion comes down on Friday. 
And in rabbinic tradition, the double portion, the number two represents the two Torahs. One is called the written Torah, one is called the oral Torah. One is called the obligation, na'aseh, we shall do. And then when you have something written out for you, you interpret it, and that's your oral Torah. And the third one deals with menstruation, the period, and the woman going through a period of uncleanliness and then cleanliness for the purpose of the Cordo Act to bear the children, to continue the people in the next generation. That's how I see the 93. And whether it's factual or not is irrelevant. There's a story behind the 93. And so how to read that story. I have, with time still permitting, I hope, a number, a letter that's found in their name. And if I can see it carefully, I'd like to read it for your benefits. My problem at this moment is the sight in this very dim room here. The letter of the 93. We have cleansed our bodies and purified our souls. Well, that means the girls were told to clean themselves so that Nazi soldiers would be able to permit them. You get it? They're going to commit to, so that for them to be to be clean so that you can have an intercourse forced on girls. And so the girls clean their bodies and purify our souls, they say, and now we're all at peace. Death holds no terror. We go to meet it. We have served our God while we're alive. We know how to hollow him in death. A deep covenant binds all 93 of us. Together we study God's Torah. Together we shall die. We have chanted psalms and are comforted. We have confessed our sins and are strengthened. We have prepared to take, we are now prepared to take a leave. The letter continues. Let the unclean come to afflict us. We fear them not. We shall drink the poison. We shall drink the poison. We shall drink the poison and the innocent and the pure as befits the daughters of Jacob. And now we'll listen to the next words. So our mother Sarah, we pray, here we are. We have met the test of Isaac's binding. Pray with us for the people of Israel, compassionate Father. Have mercy for your people who love you, for there's no more mercy in man. Have mercy for the people who love you, for there's no more mercy in man. Reveal your loving kindness, save your afflicted people, cleanse and preserve your world. And then it continues, in addition to the letter, the hour in the Ela approaches, quiet grows our hearts. One request we make to our brethren, and wherever they may be, say the Kaddish for us, say the Kaddish for the 93. This is a letter composed in the name of the 93. According to the record I'm able to investigate, there was a letter said to have been written by the teacher of the 93. According to Lucy Davidovich, it's all a fabrication. As far as I'm concerned, this is an example of historiosophy. You deal with genocide, you deal with life, not in factuals, but in actual terms. Historiosophy is garbage use of the term, a philosophy of history. The 93 purify themselves, not to be taken by Nazis. They cleanse themselves in the mikvah, in the body water, which they would have done if they had a normal life, before the Cordo Act, before they can bring children into the world. The 93 testify before God, the compassionate one, as if to imply we fulfilled your commandments, as if to suggest, why don't you respond to us? But the response, if you will, is for the living, is for the afflicted. Would you say the Kaddish for us? Would you say, Yitkadav, Yitkadav, Shemei Rabbah, sanctified and magnified is thy sacred name? Would you say the Kaddish that ends with, Oseh Shalom bin Romav, Yaseh Shalom Aleinu, Yaakov Yisrael, Vimru Amen? He who makes peace on high may bring peace upon us and all of Israel. Let's say amen. Would you end in the Elah service by saying this? The Elah is the end of the Yom Kippur service. And in conservative synagogues, less so, more so than Orthodox, do you have this particular prayer recited by the 93? 
the prayer called the Kaddish is magnifying, glorifying God's name. How do you say the Kaddish if you're about to commit suicide, violating one of God's mitzvot? How do you say the Kaddish when God as God as God is terribly silent? What I find remarkable is that in Orthodox synagogues at the Elah service, they say the 13 attributes of God, which ends with God, Pokeda Vona Vot, and God basically, you know, visits the sins of the fathers by the children, second, third, and fourth generation. But that sentence is left out. God will purify. That's how the Nila service ends with that word, purify. But the actual text in the book of Exodus has Yeah, the 13 attributes of God ends with the visiting of the sins of the parents on the second, third, and fourth generation. What these girls are doing is a major violation of Jewish law. They feel they're doing a major mitzvah. They are defying the Nazis not to defy their bodies. They're telling the living who read their letter to please carry on with the purification of what they just went through the mikvah. 